You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by SIBO. SIBO is one of the world's largest exchange holding companies, and we're inspired every day to innovate some of the industry's most powerful products, technology, and solutions. We are the industry's leading force driving access to global markets. A better trading experience and powerful data and analytics to inform better strategies. We are committed to engineering new ways to help our customers realize their potential and navigate the marketplace of tomorrow today. Visit SIBO.com, that's CBOE.com, to learn more about our expanded offerings. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for the old viewing of volatility. Yes, it's time for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. At least we hope so. If you're not doing so already, make sure wherever you're listening to this uh, that you hop on over, grab our full network feed. I know Vol Views is fun. We don't blame you if you just want Vol Views, but there's a lot of other good stuff there, too. Pretty much a dozen shows. You can pick your poison. Option Block, Advisors, Option Twifo for all the futures options, Vol, and fun stuff we talk about there. Maybe like the tech side, got you covered, daily news, all that fun stuff. Make sure you grab the full network feed. And, of course, wherever you're listening to this, iTunes, Stitcher, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Make sure if you like what you hear, throw a few stars our way. It always helps with the rankings and the searches and all the other voodoo that goes on in those engines and vehicles and all that other fun stuff. And, of course, for those of you who can't wait, you need to have it in your hair holes right away. We do make the show available live every Friday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern via Mixler. So if you're on the old podcast version, you're saying to yourself, hmm, I want to check that out. Make sure you clear your schedule for noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern every Friday. And you too can join us on the fun. Just grab that link over there on the Twitters and the Facebooks. And you too can play along with the live game. And of course, however you listen live after the fact, hit us up. Questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom, volatility, insights, all that fun stuff. We do on occasion enjoy hearing from you guys. All right. And joining me on the old program today, I think we got the full team assembled. So let's see. Let's see who we got. We threw out our ball hook. Let's see who we caught. Starting off, I believe, with the greasiest of meatballs himself, Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the show, sir. Good to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing good. You know, a little birdie told me that you guys had a big, easy, easy, uh, <laughs> easy VIX event last night. What, sir, is so easy, pray tell? What were you talking about in the easy VIX event? Uh, I, we called it VIX Made Easy. It got a... Uh, and really what it was was Andrew spent... Uh, what turned into an hour and a half uh, explaining kind of how the VIX works, uh, talking about how it operates, uh, and trying to make it more understandable for people that, you know, look at it and and think, oh, my gosh, that's too complex. You know, if you take a complex problem and break it down into small, simple parts, it becomes less scary. And that's what Andrew did last night. It was a great success. We had a bunch of people. Everybody loved it. Uh, we had a lot of people say, wow, I'm so excited that I did this and I'm happy that I uh, I got the uh, I took this course and now I'm going to sign up for the trial. 
And if people missed it and they want to check out the archive, can they go get it over there at optionpit.com or is it a one and done, no longer available? No, it, it is uh, It is available. It's uh, You go to optionpit.com slash blog. I believe it is the first or second post there. And I did tweet it out last night as well. There you go. So check it out. If you like all things VIX, and I'm guessing if you're listening to this show, you probably do, check out over there the VIX Made Easy if you want a couple of hours of good old rock lobster with a sprinkling of meatball talking all things VIX. Uh, check it out. Speaking of sprinkling, I think we got him uh, sprinkling in. You know, the Skype gods are not smiling on him today, but we'll see. We'll see if we got him. Mr. Rhodes, a.k.a. one day in about 27 or 2027 or so, Dr. Vix, a.k.a. the man about town at SIBO, a.k.a. the former director of education over there at the Options Institute. Mr. Rhodes, are you there, sir? Are you joining us? I'm guessing by your pressing silence that the answer is no, sir. <laughs> we can see him, listeners. He just, I don't think, can hear us. So we're going to try to get him back on. Meanwhile, we're going to keep on rolling right on into the trading box. Gosh, maybe the wrong show. The volatility review. <laughs> It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the Volatility Review. All right, everybody, welcome to the Volatility Review. This is indeed the portion of the show where we break down the week that was and indeed still is from a vol, re vol review, vol analysis, vol education, vol activity, all that good stuff. Let's just check and see. Mr. Do we have Mr. Rose now? Are you there, sir? Go I don't on. think you do. You satisfied with your message. Nope. Press you one. To <laughs> Skype God still not smiling on Mr. Rhodes. Well, we'll try. Tell you what. Third time is always the charm, listeners. The magic of technology. Sometimes it does not want to play ball with you. We're going to try a third time to get Mr. Rhodes on the old program, and let's see if uh, if this magic can work. Let's see if my vamping has lasted long enough. Mr. Rhodes, are you there, sir? I'm here. Aha! You got me on the phone? There he is, third huh? time the charm. By, the, by this magical yeah. technology known as telephone. Are you familiar with it? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> what's going on, guys? How are things in all places, all lands of SIBO, sir? Uh, busier than a one-legged man in a skipping contest hey what's this i saw you doing like a, a weekly options rundown for interactive brokers sir I, I felt violated and cheated upon what are you doing are you are you extending your weekly vix options analysis to other parties now i i do lots of things i do interactive brokers i'm on stocks and jocks i'm all over the place so i felt dirty I'll, i felt dirty and used and soiled after i watched that i i always so let well. you know when i do other you things. are <laughs> you don't my care. favorite you are my favorite person on stocks and jocks there you oh, go. Know, that, that, that's that, casting. That's, that's an easy competition. That's casting there. very minimal praise, sir. All right. Since, you, since you're here, since the Skype gods are well, not the Skype gods, but the, the telephone gods are actually smiling upon you, sir. Tell us what has been catching your eye in the midst of your various hits on all other outlets these days. Uh, what's catching your eye in the world of volatility? I should, I should actually break it down before we even do that. I've been so busy kind of getting everybody wrangled here on the show. I mentioned, of course, we are streaming it live on Friday here, the 17th of November, right around noon central time, and most of the major indices uh, off slightly on the day. It was, they were off a lot earlier in the week than we saw rally ho mode yesterday. Most of the major indices up about a percent. The tech-heavy Nasdaq up about 1.5%. Today, given some of that back, most of the major indices off slightly. Uh, the S&P, kind of the Goldilocks, off about two-tenths of a percent. The Dow leading the charts to the downside off nearly half a percent. Tech heavy Nasdaq kind of shrugging, saying, eh, almost unched on the day. And VIX uh, giving up a little bit of that juice we had going on throughout the week, off about four tenths of a point, so right about 11.35. After flirting this week with the 12 handle, yes, the 12 handle, we actually got up there this week. I know that sounds crazy town how high it got. Actually, the highest of the week was 14 and a half, if you believe that, uh, back on Wednesday, I believe. So. We did see some actual volatility for a minute, and then everyone got excited, and they, uh, they, they, they of course, uh, kiboshed it by saying, yay, VIX is back, and now it is uh, much lower. That said, not low enough for my, my crystal ball prediction, but that's for another day. All right, Mr. Rhodes, sir, it's been a crazy week. What's some catching your eye this week? Bitcoin. 
I'm not familiar with that. What, what is this Bitcoin you're speaking? Bitcoin, of? Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Now we've uh, we're uh, going through the regulatory review to launch Bitcoin, so it's uh, been a big focus at SIBO this week. Uh, I did. I don't know if you saw. I did a blog earlier this week, and I was amazed to find out after running the numbers that VIX has actually the price action in VIX has actually been more volatile than the price action in Bitcoin this year. I did see really? that. As I much, did see that. In fact, yeah, it's, it's in the show notes. The headlines is the Bitcoin has gotten um, the realized vol on Bitcoin prices is around 75% if you do it over like a rolling 30 trading day thing. You do the same thing for VIX, and it's like 86%. Yeah, I, I did see that. That's why it's, it's in the show notes, sir. I was going to save it for later, but hey, we'll talk about it now. That sounds fun. You should check out uh, Russell's blog on this uh, topic over there at SIBO. Uh, the title is called, very simply enough, Bitcoin versus VIX. What has been more volatile in 2017? As you guys would imagine, we've been getting a lot of questions on this and related topics. People just want to know, you know, what's the vol of Bitcoin? We actually debated this on, on Twifo last week or two weeks ago. Comes in, turns out it's not as volatile as you'd think. You know, it makes all these headline making, you know, 40% down days and things like that. But I think the actual implied vol out there at Bitcoin was somewhere around, a, I believe, a 60, 65%, somewhere in that range. So it wasn't perhaps, you know, the 200 that people would assume, I think, when they, when they hear these names. They also would probably assume VIX has been anemic and Bitcoin has been rocking and rolling. So Bitcoin would be blowing the pants off of VIX from a vol perspective. But uh, looking at your chart here, Mr. Rhodes, it uh, does not appear to be the case. Give us a quick, uh, quick summary. You said you did rolling 30 day realized, which is the real vol, the actual vol, not, not this implied nonsense. Uh, what's uh, what did you find? Well, I just I the first thing I did was I took a look at this year and just compared the rolling 30 trading day volatility of the two of them and basically it at times VIX is more volatile and at times Bitcoin's more volatile. Um and then I looked back over history and actually uh Bitcoin volatility they they kind of they just take turns. Sometimes Bitcoin's more volatile and sometimes uh the uh, the CBOE volatility index realizes more price volatility. Uh, I looked over the last five years. I think I guess if you go before 2013, uh, Bitcoin prices don't mean a whole lot. Uh, in 2013 and 2014, the average 30-day realized vol on Bitcoin was 116% and 87% respectively. Uh, they had a couple of quiet years, 53% and 39%. And this year, as of a couple of days ago, it was 76%. Um, and VIX has been consistently uh, around 80 to as high as 111% in 2015. So exciting stuff. And we were kicking around how we think Bitcoin's going to behave or how the, the futures will trade uh, once we get through the regulatory process. And you know, it, one of the comments was, I'll bet it trades kind of like VIX. And lo and behold, that vol the, the vol are they going to be European style? Are they going to be European style, Russell, or will they will be American? They're not options; they're futures. No, I mean, like, well, futures. You can, uh, can't you exercise futures yeah. early? You could if you wanted to. I don't. I think you have to hold them to expiration. All right. I yeah, I'm just the, kind uh, of interested in how that. The, the, I look at the product yeah. specs, but that's yeah, what I, I think. love that. Yeah. They don't, so, they don't have so. any more insight into when that's uh, when that's coming, right? I mean, I know you guys got to deal with the SEC. CME's got a little bit of a head start dealing with CFTC. It's a little bit of a of a quicker process. Uh, but you guys, are, are, they, are they thinking 2018 now? Is that what they're thinking? Well, you know, first off, you know, we filed first. Right? I know, I know. I know. That's why I'm amazed that CME's <laughs> getting in there. Your guys idea. That's, we had that, we that had your my, guys that, on. I'm bummed that we filed first, and a lot of people forget about us. Um, no, I have absolutely positively no insight into that whatsoever. And uh, anybody that knows something around here sure as heck isn't going to share it with me. Yeah, I had your guy on who's responsible for the Bitcoin. It was a while ago. It was at least a month, if not two months ago, right after you guys announced it. Uh, so you guys clearly uh, clearly had first mover advantage and then uh, CME swooping in, trying to trying to ride your coattails a little bit there. But yeah, it's, it's a, clearly a hot space. You know, coming out of conferences like OIC this year, where it was kind of dire, everyone's kind of wringing their hands. Where are we going to get some vol? Where are we going to get some volume? What's going to happen with this space? Here is this product category that kind of fell in everyone's laps, and everyone actually seems to legitimately be interested in it. So uh, there are there are definitely worse things than trying to create some products, listed products, to tap into that. Because what's the one thing everyone complains about with that space? There's no real bids to hit or offers to lift. It's kind of all this ethereal kind of fragmented venues all over the place. Who knows how reliable they are? They all have. Different 
different limits of how much you can actually trade. And so there's a lot of issues with that. If you have a li listed product with an actual size behind it, you could trade and measure and analyze how much, how much better would that be? So uh, hopefully we'll get some of those off the ground. Mr. Meatball, I know you've been talking easy VIX. Probably not Bitcoin, but uh, it's been a crazy week. VIX getting some life again, then kind of losing it a little bit again. Uh, what's, been, uh, what's been catching your eye this week, sir? Well, let, you know, before we move on from Bitcoin, let's talk about SQ Square. So they announced they're going to set up uh, what amounts to their own kind of um, uh, Bitcoin buy and sell area. And... The stock is off to the races. It had already been a hot stock, and now it's even hotter. So I think it's kind of interesting that, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, is apparently a very hot hot thing. I mean, it's, it's doing extremely well, and uh, I, it's fascinating. Now, other things, mm -hmm. how about the turnaround of the Russell? That was not the Russell Rhodes. Yeah. That thing is, all, I'm always bullish the Russell Rhodes, but I'd been a little yeah. bearish. Uh, I'd been a little bearish on um, the Russell Index, and uh, I am less so now. Uh, so that was a pretty nice, that was a pretty nice move, uh, and I'm uh, uh, just kind of crazy down and crazy up. You know, we talked about the fact that the S and P really hasn't been moving very much, but guess what is? The Russell 2000 is flying. Uh, that's why the RVX is so much higher than the Russell 2000, and you know, so it's really been kind of an interesting, uh, interesting period to watch those types of equities. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I saw Square kind of launch into the moon recently, and I was like, what, what the hell is going on out there? I kind of joked myself, are they doing something with Bitcoin? And sure enough, I dug into the news, and that's exactly what they were doing. Because these days, it's kind of like the old dot-com days. What do they do? Oh, they're online. Okay, they're going to the moon. Uh, you know, these days, what do they do? Oh, it's involved in crypto. Okay, it's going to the moon. It's, it's the new online of uh, 2017. They, if anyone invokes crypto or Bitcoin in any way, there's, it's, I think it's a written rule that stock has to double forthwith. Uh, so, yeah, Square uh, making a little life to themselves. Otherwise, they were kind of a bit of a staid, you know, card reader. We talked about them on, our, I think, our option block show not that long ago. Not it's the sexiest in names, quite frankly. You plug the little thing in. It works. It's cheap. It's good. It's a great little business. It's fine. But it wasn't blowing anybody's doors off. And now that they're adding this uh, outlet, which, again, gets kind of back to the, the fragmented nature of Bitcoin. The fact a lot of people who have a lot of these things lament the fact that they can't really do much with them. There's a lot of, they can't really hit a lot of bids to get out of them. They can't uh, spend them on a lot of things. So having another outlet to be able to exchange or, or you know, get some liquidity for these things, probably uh, a good thing. Looking out at the week that's been in terms of all things vol as well, you know, VIX has been moving, as Russell alluded, you know, it's as volatile as Bitcoin, if not more some days or some years. And people think VIX is low, e a.k.a. There is no volatility of VIX, but if you listen to the show, you know better. We've been talking about VVIX, which is, of course, the volatility of VIX, and it's been back up around 100 again, which is indeed elevated. And you know, people forget, I mean, we have upside moves, so everyone equates that to volatility and thinking, oh, VIX is up, so therefore there's, there's volatility of VIX again. Be, moving to the downside, people forget this all the time in the vol space. Downside moves, also volatility, and we saw a lot of that over the past year or so. So this has been a, a volatile period, and we're in one yet again here with VVIX hovering. Hovering around uh, 100, getting as high earlier this week as about, oh, about 113 or so. So usually gets up to around 125 or north of that. That's when things get really crazy cakes. And so far, uh, we flirted with that earlier this week before calmer, cooler heads prevailed. Uh, speaking of cooler heads, not to be found out there in the SKU index, creeping up again up to 136. So after coming off down to around 125, which is kind of like the average for uh, that product, getting back up about seven points this week on around to 136. Again, a lot of moving parts to that equation, a call wing and a put wing, so investigate them independently. But look, looking at that number as a whole can give you a little bit of an indicator that something is afoot that perhaps you may, indeed you may, want to investigate on your own. And all things NASDAQ vol uh, coming off a little bit as well. It was trading in the 15s or so last week, now about 1382s off well over a point uh, this, since this time last week. Speaking of things off, Mark, you mentioned uh, the Russell and the movements out there. You know, we talked last week. There was a surprising little burst of life out there. And our old friend RVX used to talk about this a lot. This is, of course, the Russell 2000 VIX. And it has options listed on it. And we used to talk about it a lot on this program. Haven't talked about it in a while. But this is the time frame. These are the moments when RVX usually catches some attention. Times when uh, Russell Vol and the VIX tend to disassociate. That makes it exciting 
for trading between the two indices. So we saw a little bit of signs of life last week. We saw, I think, a 200 lot go up last week in RVX. So Mr. Mr. Meatball, I'm going to put the quiz to you again. How many contracts do you think we saw lighting up RVX today, sir? Today or this week? You can do, you can do both. I'll have to dig a little bit to find the answer for this week, but you can do for today. I'm okay. going to say... Let's do this week. Fine, I'll give I'm you this week. Are you there, sir? We're losing you. Uh oh. All things Skype guys not smiling on anybody today. Are you there, Mr. Meatball? All right, you know what? We're gonna get him back. Meanwhile, I guess Russell, you're gonna play the game instead. <laughs> Russell. What's the game? <laughs> how many con- no, how, many, no, how many how many how many, how many we'll, RBX we'll, options have traded? Yeah, this, I'll give you make it easier. We'll go this week. This week? Oh god. Uh, Twenty seven. I'm back. I'm gonna say uh I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say, uh, mm, I'm going to say a hundred on the week and four today. And Russell, what did you say? I said 27, 27, both of you ever optimistic. I like it. I like it. That's the way to be thinking. Unfortunately, uh, well, Russell, you're closer. Uh, unfortunately it hasn't been a light em, rock em, sock em week. That's kind of seems to be how RVX trades It trades in spurts. Uh, and there really was no paper or there actually, I'm sorry. There was a one lot on uh, back on monday and then there was a 45 lot actually on wednesday so we saw a whopping 46 contracts this week unfortunately zero today so a little bit lighter this week mr meatball but uh, rista Rhodes, i guess you get the uh, you get the uh, closest without going over bonanza but it's ca- starting to uh, starting to spark up i know i've been talking to those folks over there at russell and they're starting to uh, they have a team in place now to really start talking derivatives again and start pushing these products and so i think we're going to see a little bit more action out there and pro- cuz quite frankly this is the time when a product like that should be trading so if you're always if you're the legion of you out there who are writing to us saying we like vix but is there anything else out there too that we can trade with it or against it well rvx is a good example you just got to deal with some wide spreads until some volatility starts or some volume starts going in again but still uh you know it's an interesting product worthy of at least note uh, this time if you don't want to trade it itself looking out at the big vix futures aka the answer to all volatility questions, at least most of them. Uh, we saw coming in this morning, it was uh, looking pretty hefty out there, about a point to the front month from the cash and about two and a quarter points out about two months. So right about the range we kind of expect these days for that coming off, this cash coming off a little bit today, so that's probably widening going into this afternoon. And speaking of going into things, let's get on into some hot weekly options action. I know Mr. Rhodes is versed on it because he's been talking about it all week with everybody else. So it's time for him to talk about it with us. It's time for Russell's Weekly Rundown. Now, Russell's Weekly Rundown. All right, Mr. Rhodes, you know what time it is. And since you've been talking about it all week, I'm going to bump you up to about 48 minutes. Are you ready, sir? Go. You know, I actually have five pages of trades. <laughs> so if you want me to, I can. Uh, I'll go through. I, I, I Really, I can just do some cool highlights. Uh, somebody sold. The, fir- the first big weekly trade of the week was on Monday. Somebody sold 100 of the D's 13th, 19 calls for $0.45. Cents. Uh, saw, saw a smattering, and actually this got mentioned to me when I was in the pit yesterday, uh, a lot of just random out-of-the-money uh, option buying for uh, for uh, for using weeklies uh, out of the money call buying. Uh, this one's not out of the money, but it is a long trade. Somebody bought 433 of the November 29th 10 calls for 210. Uh, a lot of outrights and not as many spreads, but here's a spread. Uh, somebody bought 200 of the November 29th 12 calls for a buck eight and sold the November 29th, 14 calls for 63 cents, uh, paid 45 cents. If we get a big old spike above 14 and it stays above there, uh, they can make as much as a buck 55 on that. Uh, and then somebody taking the other side, selling 500 of the November 29th, 10 calls. Uh, here's a big trade that got done in lots and lots and lots of pieces. Um, somebody selling... Uh, and they, the first time they did this, they sold 2,500 of the November 15th, 12 puts for 79 cents, and then bought 2,500 of the November 29th. So the November 15ths were the standard expiration that went off the board to di- uh, two days ago. Um, they bought 2,500 of the November 29th, 12 puts for a buck 17. That was a uh, 38 cent cost. Looks like rolling transactions. They did 5,000 more for a 42 cent cost. 
than they did 5,000 later for a, for a 33, 43 cent cost. Um, just lie, and they, they actually some more rolling trades in those same strikes showed up on Tuesday. Uh, somebody sold 8,318 of the December 13th, 16 calls for 64 cents, and somebody bought 327, all kinds of fun lots of the December 6th, 13 and a half puts for $2.30, expecting low vol once we get through November. On Tuesday, I think. This was a roll, kind of a, a rolling transaction, or yeah, I think this was kind of a rolling transaction um, where somebody actually bought the 300 of the November 15th nine and a half calls for 246, and then they sold 300 of the December 13th 10 calls for 261. Uh, you know, maybe ch- covering a short call trade, rolling it out and taking a small credit. That's what it looks like. Uh, the, here's where the upside buying is. Somebody bought 200 of the November 29th, 27 calls for a nickel, and then bought 200 of the November 29th, 28 calls for a nickel, and then came back and bought 100 more of the November 29th, 28 calls for a nickel. Uh, a call stupid, way out of the money, and stupid, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not supposed to have an opinion, but you could say that uh, unless we get the volatility event of the past few years, they won't be stupid, but you know that's that's spending a lot of nickels on options yeah. that haven't been touched in years since time, Obama yeah. was president. Um, so also, let's see, somebody sold 200 of the November 15th 12 puts for 42 cents, and bought 200 of the December 13th 13 calls for a buck 25. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if they sell puts, just continue to sell puts to maybe try to pay for yeah. those calls. Um, uh, Russell, you know what a lot bunch of us were doing at Option Pit was the uh, the twelve ten half put spread expiring this week and just the twelve puts outright uh, yesterday uh-huh. as you know as kind of a play on volatility maybe easing off the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, so mm-hmm. a few of us were doing that. And then uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was just going oh, okay. to get no. somebody had done that trade. Figured you'd like that one. No, that uh, that one. Yeah, I I've seen a handful of. Uh, Trades that seem to be targeting a weakness going into the 22nd, uh, just and it, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it. Uh, mm-hmm. Where was I on my list? Oh, here we go. Uh, bought 160 of the November 15th, 950 calls for 253, and then sold 160 of the December 6th, nine and a half calls for 268, 15 cent credit. Bet you that was a roll. Uh, 540 more came in a little bit later and took in a 17 cent credit. Uh, and then 340 and 210 throughout. These were just smattered throughout the day. Uh, an outright buyer on Tuesday of 200 of the December 6th, 16 calls for 45 cents. Uh, and somebody bought uh, 147 of the November 15th, 11 calls for 96 cents. And then sold 147 of the November 29th, 11 and a half calls for a buck 34, uh, taking in a, a credit of 38 cents. And again, I think that's a roll. There are a lot of, a lot of what looked like rolling transactions that occurred because VIX was a little elevated earlier this week. Um, Wednesday, um, uh, you know. Uh, somebody was buying like 500 of the November 22nd, 13 and a half calls and selling. I thought this was kind of unusual because it goes against um, lower vol into Thanksgiving and then selling 500 of the November 29th, 13 and a half calls for 84 cents. Um, you know, that, that actually would be looking for near term volatility and then tapering off. Um, got somebody who here's a put stupid. Uh, bought 200, and, and the sizes weren't the same, but it showed up as a spread trade. Uh, bought 202 of the November 23rd 11 puts for 30 cents. Bought 167 of the November 22nd 12 puts for 90 cents. Looking for a volatility crush. That sounds like um, um, the smart, uh, let's let's hope for low volatility into uh, Thanksgiving. Um, somebody sold a thousand. This trade came up a few times on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, this was a, the first instance of it. Selling a thousand of the November 29th, 15 calls for 73 cents, and buying a thousand of the no- November 29th, 25 calls for 13 cents. Uh, I think I've seen this one show up on Thursday 
as a 1500 lot, uh, but only taking in 30 cents instead of taking in, um, what did they take in, 60 cents, uh, but uh, size in the exact same two options. Here's the unusual role that I had in the back of my mind when I was fumbling a minute ago. Uh, on Thursday, somebody bought 296 of the November 22nd 12 puts for 70 cents. Uh, and then they sold 296 uh, of the the November 29th 12 puts for 93 cents, but they also bought 296 of the November 29th nine and a half puts for three cents. So when they went through everything, uh, they took in or they actually um, they actually took in a credit of 20 cents. Looks like they're just rolling out. Uh, the short put position, uh, maybe they couldn't get anything for the November 22nd, nine and a half put, so they didn't include that in the rolling transaction. And Mark Sebastian, yes, you can talk about today. Well, you we had a nice to me, so I figured I'd let you talk about it. Well, thank you, I appreciate You're that. You're welcome. We, we had a uh, a pretty decent uh, call by call weekly uh, buyer, kind of did some something interesting, and I think we've seen this trade a few times. He bought the um, 50,000 of the November 29, uh, 20 calls, and against it, or 52,000, and he bought, against it, he sold uh, 8,000 of the December 17 calls. So it is uh, definitely a play on um, some sort of near-term volatility explosion with very little uh, after the fact. Um so he's counting on some sort of, you know, volatility will e volatility is going to go up, and then it will stop going up. That's kind of what he uh, mm -hmm. he's betting on. It, you know, it kind of looks like just an interesting way to finance a uh, a pretty decent sized hedge, uh, where he's really worried about something happening next week, not about uh, some sort of long term event. I wonder whether this is a hedge against some. Uh, interesting, um, you know, some kind of interesting uh, uh, income portfolio or something like that. Uh, you know, that that is interesting mm -hmm. to me. Is this part of the new Carmen Line Fund? You doing a little more size now? Yes. <laughs> this is the launch of the new fund, kicking it off uh, with fifty thousand of the weeklies at a bit of a ratio spread. There. Uh, speaking of uh, lighting things up, what's been lighting it up this week out there? in the big by the way russell before i go any further i, I think i'm just gonna is is it me or is it just like is it all of a sudden like the rise of the stupid in vix weekly options like every week you're coming on here now and you're talking more and more size stupids what's with the stupids and the weeklies it's just like uh it's like the I new trade don't. du jour it i you know and and um yeah speaking to some of the fellas in the pit about this, they're like, you know, it, it just seems like they're throwing money out there unless they just happen to be right. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and then we might have a little bit of a problem. But <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, they're just like they just can't seem to get enough of coming in and buying those out of the money options. And it's funny, they are spreading them out among uh, you know, different expirations and different strikes as well. And over the course of a few days. My, my views on stupids are well documented. I won't go on to them again here. I think they, they make almost less sense a lot of times in VIX. Particularly, these, particularly these very tight ones. You're doing like a strike or two, then you're just kind of being, then you're just being silly. But uh, that said, we'll leave that conversation for another day. You like your weekly VIX stupids? Hit us up. Let us know why you like throwing good money after bad. Uh, speaking of uh, good money this week, a lot of stuff lighting it up out there in the big VIX mothership options. A uh, pretty active week with a few days really. Really hitting it out of the park. Today, kind of light. Uh, the ADV is about 732. Looks like we'll probably hit it. It's about 575,000 contracts on the tape uh, so far today, a little bit past halfway through the session. So it looks like we're on cor course for a north of ADV day. Yesterday, 570. Wednesday, 823,000. So about 100,000 close to it north of that ADV. Tuesday, the big day, of course, about 1.3, almost 1.4 million. Monday, almost flirting with a million as well, about 962,000 out there. All of this, Mr. Rhodes can breathe a sigh of relief. That VIX call to put ratio getting a little bit lighter 
call, to one calls over puts. When he gets close to four, he starts getting a little bit nervous. I get worried for him listening. He gets all red and flustered and stuff. Of course, that's just him on a regular day. But these days, it's a little bit lighter, so he can kind of take a bit of a breath of relief. Speaking of what's hot, number one with a bullet, top 10 hot VIX uh, strikes, open interest, the big positions out there in VIX land these days. You guys can probably guess number one. It's kind of been the same ever since it went up about a month ago when that size three-way. It's been the Dece 25s still just dominating the charts. They continue to grow, so either this guy's piling in or he's just attracted a lot of attention to this strike and everyone's collectively awakened and said, you know what? I kind of like that Dece 25, kind of like Meatball did with those VXX Jan 2019 10 puts. I kind of like those. Same thing with this one. Maybe everyone looked at that and said, hey, kind of like these Dece 25s. I want to get me some of those to the tune of 854,000 open right now. Uh, This thing has pretty much doubled in the last month or so, and it was already number one with a bullet back then at around the 400 plus thousand. So it's just orders of magnitude away now, the biggest strike. This one strike, if you took a bunch of other options, names that aren't in the top 10 out there, you could probably add 100 together and it wouldn't equal the volume total for that name and just this one strike out here in VIX. So it's crazy town. Drop off quite a bit to number two, but it's still super active. The other, another part, pretty much that three ways, again, the top three oh, big positions in uh, VIX. Uh, the Dece 15s, 535,000 open uh, for number two. Number three is the first put on our list. Again, the Dece 12 puts the other leg of that three way trade, 402,000. That trade just continues to dominate the VIX charts. That shows how sizable it was when it can dominate such a sizable product for so long, going on a month now. Plus, before that, before they even rolled it back in October, it's the same story. Uh, uh, number four, the Dece 22s, 358,000. Number five, the Dece 20s, 301,000. We dropped down a little bit. Dece 17s, 264,000. Then a second and last put on our list, the Dece 11s, 200, about 225,000 open there. Uh, then we dropped shy of 200,000 now for the number eight spot. The Dece 16s are comparatively reasonable. Dece 16s, got to get you some of those. 196,000 open there. Number nine, the Dece 23s. 190,000 wrapping out the top 10. The first March on our list, the uh, March 15s with 173,000. A little bit of an outlier there. Nice to see a little bit of a break. Someone liking themselves some March, again, to the tune of 173,000 of those 15s. Interesting. I'll have to dig into those a little bit more. Total of about 9.7 million contracts open, so a little bit light after a bunch of stuff coming off the board earlier. About 7.6 on the calls and about 2.1 on million of course on the puts anything else mr meatball or mr rhodes catching your eye in the big vix mothership options before we move on some of the other stuff lighten it up this week uh you know what i saw a ton of december selling today uh the big trade of the day was we saw a uh, a pretty decent uh call uh strangle seller they sold the vix um 1214 strangle at a little over two dollars uh yesterday kind of at the absolute top uh there was a 15 a uh, 15 20 call spread seller and he was pretty much dead on uh so good job that guy and uh that was about that's about all the the major paper that i've seen strangle sellers stupid buyers crazy cake stuff out here in uh, in Vixland this week. We won't bother with the top VXX options position. You guys know what it is. Mr. Meatball knows what it is. It still is the Jan 10 puts out there in 2019. They keep they continue to grow a little bit, 115,000. Maybe Mr. Meatball picking up a little bit more for his, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for his portfolio there. Moving on, Mr. Rhodes already already jumped the gun on the, uh, on the, on the Bitcoin vol, so we won't get into that. But I do want to get into this story. Just because this people people have asked about this for a couple of weeks. We've been sitting on it because we've been so busy talking about other stuff. It's actually a pretty volatile time out there. A lot of things to talk about. We haven't had a chance to chat about this one, but we should do so now because everyone's asking us about it. This is, of course, this one kind of just it doesn't bring a smile on my face in the sense that I'm, I'm, I'm happy for the people that it happened to. Of course not. But it makes me just mad that people just listen to our show and the stuff wouldn't happen. This is, of course, uh, FINRA coming out and slapping down Wells Fargo recently for about three and a half million. Why do they find them? Well, because they don't listen to this show they don't understand vxx and so what's the product we talked about a lot in the show and what have we said many times with vxx you really shouldn't buy and hold this thing it's kind of the ultimate wrong use case for this product well that's exactly what the wells fargo reps were doing they were going out there kind of really they probably had a a cursory knowledge of volatility at best they said hey everyone likes this vix thing vxx is lighting it up does a lot of volume 
we should recommend to people that they buy and hold this thing. And then, of course, guess how that worked out? Not well. Uh, so FINRA laying down their first ever fine uh, associated with uh, a VIX ETP out there. Three and a half million dollars uh, for uh, this activity occurred between, excuse me, July of 2010 and May of 2012. So it's been a few years now back in the early, early days of VXX and uh, seeing, again, they, they, they slammed, uh, they fined Wells Fargo because their reps recommended volatility-linked ETPs without fully understanding their risks and features. Uh, this is FINRA coming out saying, you know, these are pretty much short-duration products. Uh, and uh, FINRA says, Wells Fargo reps, quote, mistakenly believed that the products could be used as a long-term hedge on their customers' equity positions in the event of a market downturn. But as FINRA points out, they are these are actually generally short-term trading products that degrade significantly over time and should not be used as part of a long-term buy-and-hold investment strategy. Maybe we should just put that as part of, like, the the description of the show that those lines because it's so it needs to get out there more clearly uh so yeah finra getting in on the on the vix action game and uh slapping down some inappropriate use out there so if you're if your advisor is recommending to you hey you should buy and hold in your ira some of this vxx stuff first off you should know about you're listening to this show so you should tell them no but then b you should tell finra about that guy because he's uh he's running amok i don't know mark this one probably brought a chuckle uh, to your face as well, not because people got hurt, but just because the fact that this people should know better by now, should they not? Yes, I was shocked by this. Actually, a couple of f- good Finra things today. I don't know if you saw the whole uh, thing they they put out about PFOF as well. They said there's a they believe it or not. They said sometimes brokers may not take their customers' best interests in mind <laughs> if there's payment for it. Or wow, it's involved. only been what twenty I years. Said, I said Finra. <laughs> <laughs> that I said no. How's that possible? Brokers would uh, never do that. Wow. But uh, twenty years late yeah. to the party, but better late than never. Well, wow. It's gonna be. It should be kind of interesting. Um, I was surprised that that they were willing to come out and say that. But uh, I think that the, it, you know, it, it wasn't a, a headline changing. It wasn't like a big headline. But I think that this could lead us. You know, if the SEC won't regulate that stuff. It'll be interesting to see if FINRA starts fining everybody for that. I, I would not be surprised if all those sweet little P5 deals, maybe there's a reason Goldman and Citadel, and, you know, all these groups that were basically the heavy payers are, are leaving the business beyond just uh, speed. Maybe they see the writing on the wall. You know, I'm kind of interested whether that is, uh, you know, that could be as much a part of it as, uh, as the other thing. Uh, now, per the Wells Fargo thing, could Wells Fargo? I th- well, we thought Wells Fargo had had shown that you know, hey, we're we're as dumb as you could <laughs> possibly imagine. The depths imagine. of their ignorance. And yes. then normally this is like the classic hold my beer joke because uh, ju- you you know I'm sitting here m- months ago people would have said Wells Fargo could not be any stupider, and then Wells Fargo goes hold my beer. And then runs in there and says, everybody, buy and hold VXX. I don't know. Russell, so, I think, Russell, when you go out and do roadshow presentations now, you should start every single one, no matter who you're talking to or what you're talking about. Is in your description and in your standard disclamatory text about, you know, these are not recommendations. You should also say, by the way, you should not buy and hold VXX. That should just be standard disclamatory material. I think, that, think that's good. Did SIBO approve that? Well, it's not just, you know, in their prospectus. I mean, everybody – I. And and one thing, the thing with Wells Fargo, my understanding is this happened a while back. It's not like it happened last week. Um, so yeah, it was, I think it happened when this product was, was a little bit newer. It was July uh, 2010 to May of 2012, at least the act, the activity yeah, that they cited. Yeah, I thought it was early. I was think 2012 was in my mind, but I wasn't 100% sure. Um, but still, it says all over. In fact, one of the leveraged ETPs, uh, I think it says that you shouldn't hold it for more than a day. In the prospectus, so uh, they're not. They are strategic. If you if you're using the long ones, they are strategic to to maybe hedge against a short term volatility event. Under no circumstances are they uh, buy and hold uh, buy and hold instruments. And the thing is, I don't believe. I like to not believe that uh, what what was happening five years ago in those is still happening. I don't think I like I like to believe that they have matured to the point 
where people will understand what goes wrong. Um, did you see just just as a little uh, warning type thing? Did you see the tweet that I showed? How long it took you to recover uh, from from the 2015 drawdown in mm -hmm. uh, SVXY and XIV? Um, you know, we shouldn't just be warning about. Uh, you know, VXX and, and all of those guys who have the constant uh, grind lower, uh, you know, the, the be owning SVXY and XIV, if you had bought it the last day of uh, July 2015 uh, <clears throat> and you had experienced a 48 percent drop in August, it took you 507 days to get back to even. Uh, so, you know, th those things. Uh, they do make money over time, but they do hit some really nasty potholes. Yeah, I'll follow Mr. Rhodes if you're not doing it over there on Twitter, listeners, at Russell Rhodes. Two S's, two L's. Uh, not Rhodes like a typical R-H-O-A-D-S. Uh, he puts out a lot of fun images like that, or maybe disconcerting images like that as well, where he shows you how long it takes you uh, to break. And hopefully, like Wells Fargo, and hopefully other firms have learned their lesson on this. I don't think this is going to be the last we see on this uh, area. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say there's going to be more people out there who have been doing this or are doing this right now. And they're going to get the smackdown as well, and well, they should. Meanwhile, it's time for you guys to take the reins with your volatility questions. It's time to open up the volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL, posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, right. or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the Vol Voicemail, of course, the portion of the show where you guys take the reins. Questions in hand, hit us up. You guys know how to do it. If you are listening live, you can always hit us up there as well. Let's see, so many. Um, let's see, where to start here? Uh, this is kind of a long question. Here's a silly one that came in from some guy called uh, Andrew Giovinazzi. He asks, why is the rock lobster so handsome? And uh, I think the answer to that is, <laughs> is completely unanswerable. <laughs> there's just no, it's there's, because, there's no accounting for taste. <laughs> whoever, uh, whoever put that in, it probably only can see out of one eye, and that's why they would think <laughs> there he you was go. so handsome. There you go. One eye. In, a, in the one-eyed world, Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi is king. Quite a handsome fellow, I guess, for, uh, for some of you out there, apparently. Uh, let's see. No, that's serious questions. Uh, this goes uh, – another comment. This goes from uh, – the uh, David, uh, David, just David, saying VXX is clearly the worst ETF. It has destroyed pretty much all of the value invested in it since inception. Or does that make it the best if you are short? Yeah, I guess it kind of depends on your, on, your, on your frame of reference there, David. Uh, if you've been shorting VXX, as we have uh, recommended, or indeed just nice, safe, long-term puts in VXX, uh, that's probably one of your favorite products of all time. So kind of depends. If you're doing what Wells Fargo is telling you to do, buying and holding it in your retirement account, you're probably calling FINRA right now. So <laughs> I guess a little bit uh, uh, to each their own. I don't know. I can't really call it the worst because it's, it's kind of, they say what on the, fr as, as Mr. Rhodes says, you know, they, they disclaim it. They say in, in the material, they've gotten a lot better at being proactive about that, saying, you know, you really shouldn't buy and hold this thing. And uh, people, if the people still do it, I guess at this point, I don't know if it's on them or if it's on VXX or, or a, little bit, uh, a little bit of both. I don't know. You guys think VXX is the best or the worst as a result? Of, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a uh, subjective thing, you know. I, some people might love it; think it's the best thing ever. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's kind of um, how you use it. I I keep telling people VXX does its job. I mean, if if you yeah. expect, and you know, Matt and Michael tell you it is, it, it has a very similar P and L to having a rolling thirty day put hedge, and nobody would ever look at that and say that's worthless. Um, and so, it, you know, VXX does what it says. And so, and here's what I would say is to that reader, if your definition of it just loses money is definition of a bad ET, ETF or ETN or ETP, which is, you know, not in, in an unfair, but also I think a little, a little, um, narrow then, you know, UVXY is way worse than VXX. And there are all sorts of levered things that are way worse than VXX that have lost way more dollars. Uh, notably uh, UVXY. So 
uh, I will, even by your own definition, tell you that I disagree with you. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, what do you guys call it? Predictably crappy? I think that's a good, good description of VXX. As long as you know what it's doing, uh, then, uh, then, it's, then it's okay. If you're the grandma from Iowa, proverbially, who's buying and holding this thing because your Wells Fargo rep told you to do it, that's probably a different story. Speaking of Wells Fargo, T-Mal in the chat saying, wasn't the felt Wells Fargo news a month ago? Yeah, it is. Like I said, it was old. We've been busy on the show. Uh, so many other topics. A lot of vol popping off these days. We had that, we've had that to talk about for a while now. We haven't gotten to it. Finally got around to it today. So, yes, it happened about a month, three weeks, a month ago or so. Uh, but we finally got around to it today because people have been asking us for our thoughts on that. By the way, I think we can blame our friends out there, particularly O'Fair, for killing the Vix pop this week, because he was tweeting, Vix, hello, friend. I've missed you. You appear to want to stay this time. And the second he did that, I said to him, that's it, you've killed it. Uh, even uh, Saqib over there, I think he's at Reuters, saying, you're going to scare it away. Too late. Uh, O'Fair killed it. So if everyone out there who thought Vix was here to stay, you guys can all blame our friend O'Fair over there at CML Biz. He's the one who, uh, who spooked it. Um, let's see. Uh, lonesome. This is, let's see, that's a long one. Maybe, um... These are both long ones. Well, I guess we can tackle one of them. Uh, let's see. Lonesome. <laughs> I like that. Just at Lonesome. Hopefully you're not too lonesome. If you are, hey, we got a show. You're listening to us, so let us cheer you up. Mr. Lonesome wants to know, could you tell us the process of how options market makers mitigate risk slash remain delta neutral? Again, this is a long topic. We don't have that much time. we got about three minutes left in this segment, so we'll do it quickly. Um, but that said, it's a pretty straightforward thing. We talked about gamma scalping before here on the show. That's effectively what you're talking about there uh, with market makers. You have delta. Obviously, delta neutral means you want a delta of zero, a.k.a. you want no directional exposure. So how do you hedge delta? You trade the underlying against it. So if you have long deltas, the underlying rallies a bit. You get long some deltas because you're long gamma, let's say, in this, in this equation. You're going to sell some deltas. Usually you have predefined points where you're going to sell those. What those predefined points are, it varies by everybody. Some people use technical analysis. Some people use other things, other ways to to adjust. If you're going to set those predefined points, hopefully it rallies back up. You sell those deltas, it rallies back down, and you buy them back again. You get to scalp over and over again, and that's how you usually make money or defend a long gamma position, because it's expensive to hold long options positions. They tend to decay. Uh, but that's pretty much the nuts and bolts of it. If you're short uh, gamma, it's going to be kind of the opposite, but other than that, it's going to be the same thing. You're pretty much just mitigating your delta exposure as it increases. You have set positions you use to sell deltas. You can use options to do it too, and you can use options, but it's a little bit more tricky that way. If you can get spreads off to do it, that works, uh, but usually nine times out of ten, it's straightforward just to do a lot of deltas. That said, delta neutral isn't really the game that much anymore. It's kind of hard to be delta neutral and also be profitable in these markets. You're just so tight, and they're so expensive and so risky. You kind of have to have a position, a bit of a viewpoint in order to uh, to make money these days. Uh, Mr. Meatball, you're doing just that. You're a prop man now. Any thoughts here on uh, on the old days of Delta Neutral or, or how guys are doing it today? Yeah, you know, um, the market makers, the reason why they want to be Delta Neutral is because they're getting the bid-ass spread. If you're not getting the bid-ass spread, then it's very difficult to actually run a quote-unquote gamma scalping operation. You have to be extremely, extremely tight with... Um, you know, your volatility levels and where you buy and sell. Um, you know, the, the way really market makers manage is they're trading all day. And so they're really, I think about trading uh, as a market maker is think about volatility as a stock price. So I use volatility, and this is actually a, a chapter in my book, How Market Makers Trade. Um, and, you know, volatility to a market maker is kind of like a stock price to a stock market maker. So they're, they're literally just moving their volatility around and then making markets around it uh, most of the time, the guys that are truly doing that now. N nowadays, do these guys get stuck kind of taking some deltas? Yeah. Yeah, they do. And being a market maker, you get an opportunity to have some deltas. Um, you know, I had a tendency to, to let my deltas run a little bit more. Uh, on stuff that had some momentum, but if things were stuck in a channel, we had this thing called Gamatron, and you know, with with cruddy small stocks like uh, Sun Microsystem, that was three bucks, and I was constantly long, you know, at Sun Microsystem, I was constantly long fifty or sixty or eighty thousand gamma because the stock, because you know, guys would sell me nickel calls, and uh, I, uh, you know, I would I would literally hedge it every five cents. And, you know, I might scalp 10,000 shares uh, every five cents. And the next thing you know, you've, 
traded enough to cover your decay. So that, that's kind of what, how market making works in, in, in a nutshell. In a nutshell, for those few who are out there still practicing the dark arts of market making, uh, there you go. We got to keep rolling. Speaking of dark arts, predict and VIX is a dark art, as you will see this week. Let's get to it. It's time for the crystal ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. All right, listeners, you guys know the drill by now. You know that when Russell is the low man on the crystal ball totem pole, that usually equates to a much higher VIX week. And that's pretty much what we saw until yesterday. It was pretty much on par to be the highest VIX we've seen in a long time. And indeed, it did get there. Uh, so, Mr. Rhodes, if you need your contrarian indicator for all things VIX, Mr. Rhodes and his crystal ball guesses are about as reliable as it gets. Uh, this week, yeah, I think we all pretty much lost. VIX closing out here at the show, about 11.4. All of us were well south of that. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, the low man on the totem pole, he was, he was 9.15. I was I was in the middle there, 9.65. Mr. Meatball, 9.9. None of us even in double digits. So I think we're all collectively losers this week. That said, I think least loser was the Meatball. So uh, we'll go with him. <laughs> least loser, that's a good title. Uh, Mr. Meatball, a.k.a. the least loser, what, uh, what you feeling for this week? Uh, what, did I, what did I guess last week? The 9.99. You know, that, that's one two weeks in a row. Um, well, I think I, one is, is, an, is, is one is very much it's, in air quotes this week. <laughs> yes, it has been the least least bad two weeks in a row, uh, and actually, it was really bad last week and just happened to be the closest. Uh, so I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to say nine point nine nine. There you go. If it, if it if it if it is broke, but less broke than everything else, I guess then don't fix it. Right. That's the uh, that's the moral. Correct. Of the that's my motto. The car still chugs along the road, even though it's shooting smoke and fire out behind you and choking all of the other ones. Well, I guess I was the second least loser last week, so I shall go next. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. I liked my analysis last week, but you know, there's always the caveat things might pop up. So I'm gonna go. I'm gonna say we're gonna finish out the week next week. Of course, we are. This the caveat, of course, we do have the big uh, holiday, and then that's going to play out ahead of that. Then we have like a truncated day, so on on the Black Friday session there. So it's all kinds of weird stuff afoot next week. So I may say a little bit higher, but then you know the holidays are are kind of spooking me. So I'm I'm going to say not that far away from where I actually was last week as well, but perhaps a little bit higher. I'm going to like I'm going to like the old nine. Uh, nine, let's say 9.75 or so. So uncomfortably close to the meatball, but that's kind of where I'm liking it. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, are you going to go dark side again or are you, are you turning around? I'm going up. There I go. 10.59. You know, Russell, you're kind of, you, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I think, Mark, I've got I'm a contrary you. indicator. I think, well, I think you're, but you're also, I think you bet against your own portfolio. Um, and I don't so, have a portfolio. I work in an exchange. Oh, that's true. <laughs> um, My portfolio is VIX volume. Go VIX. Go VIX. Um, but uh, you're you're kind of uh, don't get yourself a Gartman reputation. But uh, <laughs> you know, I, I I'm thinking, what has anybody launched a fund where all you do is take is get his letter and take the other side? And no, oh, but it probably wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. It would not. Um, and, the thing, the difference between the difference between me and him is he's taking himself seriously. <laughs> <laughs> that is, you know, that is true. He yeah. believes he believes what he's saying. Me, I'm, you know, hey, we're just all I'm, for fun here. I'm pickle and Rick. Show. No, uh, no actual, no actual predictions being made. Of course, it's all for fun and or entertainment, depending on what your disclaimer material says. And also, don't buy and hold VXM. Uh, that music, though, means we've come to the end of another epic journey through the world of volatility. Started off talking all things VIX, and we kind of dove into Bitcoin a little bit because you can't not these days. Uh, then we got into all things FINRA and the SmackDown. Is VXX the best or the worst? What do you guys think? Uh, we talked about that a little bit, market making, all that fun stuff. Then we once again uh, put us out for ridicule and humiliation yet again every week with the crystal ball. It's fun. Let's go around the horn one last time, though. See what everybody's cooking up. Let's start off. We talked about meatballs at the top, so let's start with Mr. Rhodes this time. What's cooking 
in the land of all things Cebu? Uh, we're getting ready to go to Asia. It's about time for Asia RMC. I, uh, I you know, when I say I'm swamped with the Bitcoin stuff, I really kind of am swamped with the Bitcoin stuff because I'm doing a road show with the Winklevoss twins. Oh, fun. And, uh, I know. And so, I, you know, it's going to be me talking about <laughs> uh, the, the pending futures and those guys talking about the uh, Gemini Trust, which is the bank that they started up to uh, allow people to easily and in a uh, in a very regulated way uh, get in and out of crypto. They uh, they they actually you open up like a regular old bank account. I heard the oh, nice. in fact, one of my one of my neighbors <laughs> he started filling out the Gemini paperwork and he he was like man they're asking me too much information and I, he called me up said, they're asking too much and I said it's just like a regular bank account. And he uh, and, and he moved on, and he bought some Bitcoin around sixty five hundred. And pizza is on him the next time we get the families together. I heard they're making some news already today, or recently saying they think Bitcoin is going to be bigger than Facebook. So there you go. Expect some. Uh, no, yeah. Expect oh a good God. media turnout on your road show. There, well, we're always there afraid you. to mention Facebook in front of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there I you can go. Imagine. They should be happy. They got a good payout out of it for not doing a whole heck of a lot. So that works out. In their favor. Speaking of uh, payout for not doing a lot, Mr. Meatball, what you got cooking here for us this week? <laughs> <laughs> you jerks. Uh, nothing. We, you know, uh, we are uh, mid. I'm doing my capital raise for uh, the new Carmen Line Broad Cap Edge Fund. Uh, we are doing a. Uh, it's a. It's a, a kind of S and P portfolio with a, a hedge over the top. Uh, if you're a qualified investor looking for a uh, a port a better way in my opinion obviously to tr- to own the S and P than a simple index fund, uh, especially with us at all time highs, uh, you know a a hedge fund that actually hedges, then uh, you know reach out to me uh, qualified investors only obviously, but uh, uh, I would love to uh, talk to you about what we're doing. You can uh, email me mark at carmenlinecapital.com. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Volatility Views. If you like all things volatility and skew, maybe a dash of Bitcoin, no no promises, but it seems to always work into that show. Uh, then tune back in at 1.30 p.m. Central if you're listening live. If you're not, uh, check it out on the podcast for Twifo, of course, where we talk all that fun stuff. I got a feeling Friday is becoming our Bitcoin show on the network. We're doing this one, and then uh, Twifo, everyone's got Bitcoin on the brain, so it's inescapable. And if you're not joining us live, then we'll see you next week for more Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by SIBO. SIBO is one of the world's largest exchange-holding companies, and we're inspired every day to innovate some of the industry's most powerful products, technology, and solutions. We are the industry's leading force driving access to global markets. A better trading experience and powerful data and analytics to inform better strategies. We are committed to engineering new ways to help our customers realize their potential and navigate the marketplace of tomorrow today. Visit SIBO.com. That's CBOE.com to learn more about our expanded offerings. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com. 